From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We are joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this Stuff They Don't Want You to Know. Coming to you live and direct yet again. We're your favorite Quentin Quarantinos. Uh, we're still keeping the lights on in our separate bunkers here. Just wanted to check in with everybody real quick. Uh, before we dive in, how are you today? I'm really good. Over the weekend, I spent some time digging through our voicemail archive and everybody that's been calling in and got to talk with several of you, uh, you listening right now, speaking to you. I've been instructed to say the word divination to prove to one person that I called that it was real. So there you have it. Um, I would just say everyone out there that I've that I've spoken to and a lot of people that have been calling in, you know, we're all still dealing with this thing. A lot of you are doing great work to continue both the economy and the health of others of us who are listening and present today. So thank you to all of you. Um, just keep doing what you're doing, especially uh, you truckers who are out there still going every day, you healthcare workers who are going every day, essential workers in the grocery stores who are going every day and putting yourselves at risk. Uh, big, big props to you guys. Well said. Uh, what about you, Noel? How's it going? Oh, it's good. I had a really nice weekend. Uh, I made uh, tie-dye shirts with my daughter, um, uh, you know, proof positive that the madness is really starting to take hold because uh, that's a thing I never would have done before. But you know what? It turns out I really like it, and it's uh, you get some really nice results. We tried two different methods. There's the uh, twist method where you put rubber bands around it like a braid of a giant ponytail, like a French braid, and there's another one where you just bunch it up and put the rubber bands around the wad, and the results are really delightful. I think I'm a tie-dye guy now. Nice. Good to hear. Uh, and, of course, you can find some of those results on our various social media, which we will shout out either during the show or at the end. Yeah, mine's at How Now Noel Brown if you want to check it out. Ben, what have you been up to? All sorts of things, you know. Um, I've been really deep into a uh, re- really deep into a, a strange web uh, that is the subject of today's show. This is something that I think is familiar to a lot of our fellow conspiracy realists. It's it's a mystery. It's a disappearance. Uh, and, you know, of course, if we are being realistic, which we must be, the sad truth of the world is that thousands of people disappear every day. Even now, in 2020, as the surveillance state grows stronger than it ever has been before— Yet, of all those disappearances, this case has always stood out for us. For me, for you, Matt, you, Noel, and particularly for Paul Mission Control Deccan himself. Recently, we received several partially redacted records from a source that prefers to remain anonymous, and this prompted us to finally dive in to one of the most mystifying disappearances in modern history. Today, we are asking, what exactly happened to Emanuela Orlandi? A quick quick bit of housekeeping here. Uh, first, our source that decided to remain anonymous or preferred that way, uh, when, when this source sent us these documents, we circulated them amid ourselves. Uh, we haven't shared them anywhere. Uh, and we're, I, don't, I don't know if we should, honestly, um, but we'll, we'll get into that. And secondly, as we like to say at the top of every um, particularly dark or violent episode, uh, there is content in today's show that may be triggering to some people. Uh, we will be talking about the allegations of sexual abuse. Uh, We will be talking about murder uh, and there will be scenes of violence. So we want to put that up there at the top. Now, 
we have to do some background for everybody who thinks Emanuela Orlandi. Who is that? Did you say Orlando? No, we said Orlandi. Uh, and let's learn a little bit about our main character here. Here are the facts. Yes, uh, Emanuela Orlandi was born in 1968, um, one of five children. Uh, and according to records, her father worked either at the Vatican Bank or was actually a, a member of the staff in the papal household. Um, according to Emanuela's older brother, Pietro, the family lived inside Vatican City and would often, they grew up uh, feeling as though the Vatican Gardens, which are lush and Gorgeous were, was was their own backyard. That's according to him, and he's been a very outspoken person in the press about this story. Um, in 1983, Emanuela was a sophomore in high school. Um, the school year had ended for the summer, and she was taking flute lessons nearby at a music school uh, at the Tommaso Ludovico da Victoria School. Um, and she was into music. She sang in the choir, uh, played the flute, and seemed to have a real gift uh, for just picking up instruments. Yeah, it was on the 22nd of June in that year, 1983, when she disappeared. And we don't know much, but this is what we do know. She left a family apartment. She was wearing a white T-shirt. She had on denim overalls and running shoes. She got onto a bus and she traveled a pretty short distance, only about two kilometers. She got off near the Piazza Navona, and um, this is right in front of the Italian Senate, by the way. She was stopped by a young man in a green BMW. There was a traffic officer who witnessed this whole scene, just uh, Emanuela getting off and speaking to this man in a green BMW. The Senate security cameras were not working that day, though, so there was no video proof of this. Uh, Matt, I just want to interject. I didn't put this in the notes, but it was important to note that uh, her brother, Pietro Orlandi, who's going to play a, a big role in this story, uh, he is the reason that she ended up using public transit. Uh, according to what we know, she asked him for a ride to the flute lesson, and he refused for one reason or another. So that's that's why she ended up on the bus. Yeah, he has stated several times over the course of all these years that they got into a uh, fight, a row, and that's why they decided not to go that route, right, for him taking her there. Um, but she did end up going to her flute class or music class as she normally would have. She did call her sister after that class had completed, and that phone call, was the last known contact that anyone ever had with Emanuela, at least the last known contact uh, to the family and to investigators. Right. Yeah. She had made plans with her sister to meet at a piazza at 7.30 p.m. And that is where her trail ends. She was reported a missing person the next day. I uh, also want to bust a myth here. In most countries, you do not have to wait 24 hours to report someone missing. That's that's a story the television has told us. Uh, if you have reasonable cause to uh, believe someone has gone missing, go ahead and report them because every hour, every second counts. So the investigation begins the next day. Tips start rolling in. Some are much more promising or seem much more solid than others. Two tips in particular capture the investigator's attention. There's one caller who refers to himself as Pierre Luigi. Uh, he, he makes a call on June 25th, and he says, I've seen this child, not in Vatican City. Uh, I've seen her earlier in Rome on the day of her disappearance. And he provided details that, made it sound believable to the authorities. He mentioned that she had a flute, a flute case with her. He described her clothing, which you described earlier, Matt, and his description matched. However, he had some interesting things to say. Uh, Pierre Luigi said the girl was not going by the name Emanuela. Instead, she was calling herself Barbarella and that she had run away from home to sell, of all things, products for Avon. That's an interesting detail, too, because it wasn't something that was out there in the public sphere. You know, it's it's pretty common 
in uh, high profile cases for authorities to withhold some information because it helps you separate the wheat from the chaff. Believe it or not, in a lot of missing cases, a lot of suspected homicides, when authorities ask the public for tips, they get a lot of really cold hearted pranks or they get some unstable people making ridiculous claims. So the fact that he knew about this Avon thing was especially fascinating because it tracked with information provided by the family. Uh, Orlandi had mentioned wanting to sell Avon products earlier to her sister before her disappearance, which is something a lot of people did not know. So a second call came just a couple of days later on June 28th. Another man claimed to have met a young woman going by Barbara who had also run away from home. And this caller said that he had seen her in a bar nearby the music school uh, and, you know, calling herself Barbara. Um, there were several other tips uh, some callers speculated that there was a uh, conspiracy afoot. A Turkish terrorist group called the Grey Wolves allegedly had planned to kidnap Orlandi, uh, allegedly, um, then exchange her for one of their members, sort of a political prisoner swap situation, a Mehmet Ali Agka, um, a would-be assassin who'd been uh, pr- imprisoned for shooting the Pope two years earlier. Uh, so what, where did it go from there? Oh, devil coins. That's where it went. And we should also mention that second caller also said the young woman who was calling herself Barbara had run away from home. So they have those commonalities. And uh, we have a great story. It's not really ours to tell. It is uh, a story from our good friend, ride or die, Paul Mission Control Decant, about uh, fascinating coins that were allegedly discovered uh during the assa- the attempted assassination of the Pope. Uh, that's a story for another day, but there's the door to the Google rabbit hole if you want to get lost uh, over the week. You're, you're asking a, a vital question, Noel. What did happen? There's no shortage of intriguing, compelling, tantalizing, that would be the right word, tantalizing theories surrounding Orlandi's disappearance and at this stage, uh, her presumed death. You know, the Turkish terrorist group, that's just scratching the surface. We have to remember the Vatican and the surrounding region is a hub of religious power, and it's a hub of mafia power. It's a hub of organized crime. And these groups often come under suspicion in the world of conspiracy. I mean, Vatican... The, the Vatican City itself is a very, very weird place. Uh, let's see, the, the age of consent for a long time, I think, was 12 years old. Uh, it's also the only place where uh, you can find an ATM in Latin, just so these aren't all horrible quick facts. Uh, and it also wields this outsized, tremendous influence on human civilization. And it has for centuries and centuries. You know, the... Um, the, the nexus of powerful religious organization, of incredibly powerful godlike financial institutions and criminal organizations, it, it all comes to a head here. In a very real way, you could say it's um, it's even more powerful than the city of London, which longtime listeners, you'll recall, is not actually London. It's just in London, and it's called the city of London. It was a very confusing time for names because Vatican City is called a city and it is a city, but it's a state and it's an uber state. And it's beyond a lot of laws that would apply to Jane and John Doe's like us and the people listening, unless you're listening and you're the Pope, in which case, thanks for checking in, man. It is uh, very odd to imagine Vatican City as a religious monarchy. That is just a strange... That's a strange thing. There, there are so few places that uh, exist in 2020 that are full-on monarchies, you know, without a parliament connected in some way or without a, a secondary governmental institution attached in some way. There are they. I'm not saying they don't exist. They are certainly, there are certainly, I guess, a dozen or so, dozens, let's say, but. Um, just to, just to have the amount of wealth and power that they have, mm-hmm. um, yeah. it's pretty strange to, to see it both together. 
And it's it's so weird to talk about this case because, you know, if you picture this episode and this exploration uh, as us walking through an art gallery in a hallway, we're passing this gigantic mural that says Vatican Conspiracies. And we're kind of pointing at it for you, but it's not its not the part of this episode that we're going to focus on. Uh, you can find our earlier videos on this. You can find some earlier podcasts we've done, but it goes very, very deep. And a disturbing amount of the things that are treated as conspiracy theories about the Vatican have later turned out to be at least partially true. This is reality. And given this reality, it's no surprise then that the Vatican is the subject of so many conspiracy theories. And like the Leeds in the Orlandi case, some of these theories are way more plausible than others. I think it's this inherent strangeness of Vatican City uh, and, and this bizarre, tragic disappearance of this 15-year-old girl that combined to make this such a mystifying mystery and, you know, this is just context for the question we asked earlier. We'll pause for a word from our sponsors and return to ask, what happened to Emanuela Orlandi? Here's where it gets crazy. Yeah, uh, decades later, this mystery is still just that. A mystery. It is unsolved, though there are plenty of theories, as tends to be the case when you have cold cases like this. Uh, we had talked about the Gray Wolves, but what about that other uh, organization that seems to thrive so readily in Vatican City? The Mafia. Uh, mafia theories um, largely revolve around a Rome-based syndicate, a crime syndicate known as the Banda della Magliana, led by Enrico De Pedis. Um, the theory states that the syndicate had loaned large sums of money to the Vatican Bank, but weren't getting their payments as quickly as they would have liked or at all. They weren't being paid back what they were owed. So they decided that taking a Vatican official's daughter for ransom was the way to get their money back. And uh, one of uh, De Pettis's former girlfriends claimed on the record that her ex told her he had kidnapped Orlandi. Um, and these claims were plausible enough that the th authorities decided to get involved. Yeah. Yeah, De Pettis himself, uh, like many mafioso, had a live-by-the-sword-die-by-the-sword situation. He was fatally shot in a square in Rome back in 1990. And years later, after, after his death, uh, an investigative journalist found out that De Pettis's body had been very, very quietly moved from a normal cemetery to the prestigious Basilica Sant'Apollinare. This is interesting because this basilica in particular is not, it, it's like a, a very exclusive club for corpses, if you want to be crass about it. Uh, this is not where ordinary people are buried. This is, this is the eternal parking spot for the bodies of cardinals and princes and other, you know, illustrious members of society, uh, Vatican and lay people alike. So it's odd that a, uh, a very successful criminal would end up, first off, buried somewhere else, and then some, for some reason have his body moved posthumously to a different site. People were freaking out. And so in 2013, uh, like you're saying, Noel, from some of the leads they got, uh, the authorities actually decided that they would open the tomb of this mobster and they wanted to see whether the rumors were true, whether it was, in fact, the case that Emanuela Orlandi was dead and that her remains were secretly placed inside the tomb of De Pettis. Which d does seem on the surface like it would be a little odd, right? Yeah, I mean, he was killed in 1990. She's been missing since 1983. That would mean seven years of waiting until you interred her into a tomb just if he was if she was put into his original resting place right and then after he got moved there were a lot of big you know what ifs but there was a there was rumor and there was 
you know, possibility. So it was looked into. And when they did open it up, they found uh, more than they bargained for, right? His, his body was there. It was a, a, a very nice sarcophagus in which he was placed. He was well-preserved. He had a, a dark blue suit and a black tie. They took fingerprints from his body. They confirmed his identity. But they also found this other thing tucked away inside this ancient crypt where he was buried. That's right. They found not just one person's remains, but multiple remains. There were dozens of boxes that held unidentified human bones. You know, so they went looking for one secret corpse and they found multiple remains. And then this is, this. here's where the plot gets even trickier. Around the same time, you said this was uh, 2013, right? So uh, roughly around the same time, a uh, returning guest of sorts to our show, the infamous Vatican exorcist, Gabriel Amorth, claimed that Emanuela Orlandi did not run away. He claimed instead that she was kidnapped by a member of none other than the Vatican police force. He said that she was kidnapped for the purpose of being abused at, uh, at sex parties, for lack of a better term, and then that she would be murdered after that. He said she had already died. He also alleged, and this is public too, it's been reported in multiple sources, he also alleged that officials of a foreign embassy they did not name, were also involved in this crime. That's important because if any of that's true, what that means is that there was an organized sexual abuse ring. Uh, Now, this is something that, you know, we hear thrown around a lot in conspiracy circles, but one of the most troubling things about these sorts of allegations is that every so often, they end up being at least partially true. And this is something that people from across the spectrum have been saying was going on in the Vatican for a long, long time. You know what I mean? Well, at the very least, we have hard proof of systematic cover-ups of sexual abuse by priests uh, and and members, high-level members of the clergy uh, in, in the Vatican. You know, to take it to the next level of organized sex abuse ring, doesn't feel like much of a jump uh, to me personally. Um, you know, people may or may differ on that, but uh, it's certainly the cover up is, is, is essentially the, the same thing as um, advocating or protecting that kind of behavior. So why would it be such a, you know, suspension of disbelief to, to think that there's a step further in actually orchestrating that, especially for people that are very privileged and used to being able to order people around and get everything they want and be waited on hand and foot, you know? Yes, but we also have the the words here from an archivist at the Vatican, uh, Monsignor Simeon Duca, who in 2016 backed up the claims of our friendly neighborhood exorcist, Gabriel. He cited, quote, credible information that, quote, certain factions inside the Vatican's diplomatic corps were involved in procuring young adolescent girls for sexual slavery. And this, this gentleman, Monsignor Duca, he also believed that Orlandi was abducted for that purpose, and he believed that she was killed when... I guess she had, it's, it's terrible to think about it this in this way, but when she was no longer innocent in the way that perhaps the people that were doing this uh, wanted. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a terrifying and, and very grim allegation. Uh, one, one thing that's interesting about both Duca and Amorth's statements is that they're inherently drawing a line to geopolitics and also to the halls of power, uh, to intelligence agencies. I mean, that's that's ultimately where that rabbit hole leads. And it also jibes with ongoing, ongoing allegations, like decades and decades old allegations that certain factions of intelligence agencies have coerced people into these heinous acts of child abuse uh, in order to ensure their loyalty. 
You know, it, it reminds like as as out there and Black Mirror esque or Dan, Dan Brownish as it might sound. Uh, these possibilities are less implausible than they might seem. So, you know, the the scariest thing about this allegation is that you can't immediately throw it out. You know what I mean? It's it's close enough to things that we know to be true that it it bears uh, it bears serious consideration, even if even if you know that headline might sound all uh, red meaty and alarmist. Um, that story doesn't come from you know thin air. There there's a a vast uh, a vast trove of precedent behind there, and you know. It, this, the thread of this continues. In 2017, an Italian journalist named Emiliano Fittipaldi, and apologies for my Italian pronunciation here, folks, uh, this journalist was given a leaked document that appeared to be from the Vatican, and it was listing expenses for the care of Emanuela Orlandi abroad. It included things like room and board, as well as gynecological examinations. Now, when I say appeared to be a Vatican document, we're being careful with our language there because the Vatican 100% vehemently denied that this document was legit. They called it a false, ridiculous reconstruction. And, um, you know, I'm still kind of stuck on the allegations of an organized abuse ring. It makes me it makes me think back when um, we we're talking with Dan, uh, with Dan Harmon, and he actually changed my mind about whether large scale conspiracies were pop were possible. Do you remember that? And he's like, "Look, maybe they'll just tell you you can be in with us, but you have to eat this baby." Right. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, it's compromised, right? People, when people are compromised, uh, it's a lot easier to control them. And this brings us to another potential lead, uh, one that we will address in full after a brief word from our sponsor. <laughs> And we're back. It's time to introduce a character known as Cardinal Ugo Paletti. Yes, and to discuss Cardinal Paletti, we have to jump to 2005, when there was a television program called Who Has Seen? And on that program, there was an anonymous caller who alleged that Emanuela had been seized at the behest of someone Cardinal Ugo Paletti, who in 1983 was Vicar General of Rome. This anonymous caller said, quote, On the matter of Emanuela Orlandi, to find a solution to the case, go see who is buried in the crypt at St. Apollinaire Basilica and about the favor that Renatino did for Cardinal Paletti at the time. Right. The caller also heavily implies that the motive behind the uh, kidnapping, which they thought it was, and the later burial, uh, was itself uh, sexual in nature. Now, Cardinal Paletti passed away, so we can't get an official statement from him at this point, uh, but we do know a few more things about him. We know that back in 1990, he is the person who greenlit the removal of De Pettis's body and its uh, reinterment in the basilica. Uh, this this basilica again is usually reserved for uh, the burial of senior clerics, uh, not mafioso crime bosses. And this is also like we learned about Paletti because of these documents sent to us. By our source. Uh, we want to be completely fair here. Uh, a lot of this is in English, a lot of it's in Italian, and we have not been able to verify the authenticity of what we were sent, but it's got some damning stuff in it, if it's true. Yeah, completely. Uh, a lot of it appears to be some kind of transcript of a conversation where the concept of uh, Paletti being... I don't know. There's some language that's really kind of 
vague. Uh, he's referred to as having certain like proclivities, kind of. You know, I think the implication being that he likes young girls. Uh, there's also discussion of hiring kind of high class call girls as well uh, thrown around in there, but it's not clear to me. And I, I, I did ask the listener um, to clarify and to maybe help with some translations, but, but haven't heard back uh, since the initial, uh, you know, kind of document dump. Um, I'm not quite sure who's meant to be speaking in these, um, but like you said, Ben, it, it is, it is quite damning. So let's, let's talk about the implications here. We, we'd already gone over someone who was buried in that basilica, right? Our mafioso fellow, De Pettis, and or De Petty, however you say it. And this tip that came through in 2005 is referencing a move that occurred in 1990, which is the year that the mafia fellow, De Pettis, was killed, correct? And... The burial, like who is buried, that's the the thing here, who is buried there in the Basilica at St. Apollinaire. Um, They did find dozens of sets of bones when they did end up incurring or looking at the tomb in 2013. So it all, it gets a little confusing here, but essentially it's, this person would allegedly be, is allegedly saying that this cardinal had this person killed, Emanuela, and then her bones perhaps moved around to different burial places. It's pretty odd. But again, we did find a bunch of bones, and we're going to keep going on here. We're going to learn what officially, from the Vatican at least, what who those bones were, or how old they were at least. And this is just something to quickly clarify here in that quote that we read earlier about on the matter of Emanuela Orlandi, um, they, it's referenced, a name is referenced, Renatino. That name is referring back to De Pettis, the, the mafia uh, boss that we mentioned earlier there, who is in fact buried at the St. Apollinaire Basilica. So basically what was being, you know, alleged here in all of this discussion was that perhaps... Renatino or De Pettis, the mobster, did a favor for Cardinal Paletti, and then Paletti in turn did a favor for Renatino or for some other reason to obfuscate other bones or the burial of other, you know, people who were killed, had Renatino moved to that basilica from where he was first interred. Perhaps. I think. Is that correct, Ben? <laughs> Yeah, that's about the size of it. The allegation is that it was a quid pro quo situation. Now, when this source first reached out uh, to me, and I believe to you as well, Noel, uh, one of the first things I did was capture images of what this source sent so I could share it and get us all in the loop on email um, instead of me just like, telling. Like, that's the thing with this stuff. We can't really verify it. That's an important point. You know, I made it at the beginning, but I want to I want to underline that still, if any of this stuff is true, it is um, as fascinating. And we're following up with this source to see uh, what we can learn about the provenance of the stuff we found here to see what we can learn about the uh, what they see as the latest developments or unfolding developments. But. This paints a picture of Cardinal Ugo Paletti as sort of a, a, a known predator uh, and indeed a, a sadist. There's an interesting line where they say uh, he was known for these weaknesses of his, as they euphemistically called them, and that uh, people also knew he was therefore easy to blackmail because like the intelligence agency Honey traps we had mentioned earlier. Uh, there was, you know, there was a way to get leverage on this person. He was apparently uh, pretty ruthless, definitely in the political sphere. I mean, you think that politics in your country get nasty. Imagine what goes on in the halls of the Vatican, right? Uh, where people are, are are jockeying for position in one of the most powerful institutions in the world. So Paletti played the game well. Uh, he was able to make the right connections, apply pressure, but he was also 
uh, due to his alleged activities, he was also easy to pressure himself because you want to keep these kind of um, these kind of despicable actions. Uh, you want to keep them secret. So there's this allegation that in 1989, the judiciary of Italy, of Vatican, had names of companies that own these phone numbers, and the administrators of these phone numbers were linked to the mafia. They were under their control. And the recordings that were gleaned from these phone numbers paint the picture of an organization that is participating in human trafficking, providing women and children uh, to their, quote, high-ranking friends. Essentially, that it's a vast network of uh, of, of forced sex work, uh, and it caters to the elite. That's, that's again, that, that's what these documents are saying. Uh, it's terrible that, you know, it's terrible that we can't verify this stuff. It would be amazing if we could just come out and say, Hey, look, this has been confirmed. There's action that could be taken now, but we have to caution anyone who's listening to not think of that as fact because we cannot verify any of that stuff as of this moment. No, we can't. And, 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 you know, just to clarify too, our, our, our source um, has somewhat clarified that these transcripts that we're discussing were interviews carried out by this individual and a team, but uh, this person is not willing to uh, share the identities of any of the any of the interviewees. So even if there are accusations being made that are very inflammatory and damning, like the stuff about potentially hiring sex workers and this notion of Paletti's kind of proclivities and also uh, ties to underworld organizations and mob ties, um, we don't have the context of understanding who the speaker is. Understandably, this individual wants to protect their sources because they're afraid that they could actually be in harm's way because of the power of, of, of the Vatican. And uh, again, we, we, we are not personally as a show accusing anyone ind individually about this, but it's hard to, you know, you can't, we can't just gloss over getting this information. Um, it's, it's definitely seems like this is a, uh, a serious amount of work has gone into this project on this individual side. Um, but we were not able to confirm, you know, any of this stuff. And, and because we don't have the information to be able to do that because we don't even know who's talking. But I think it's worth mentioning. And in the most recent exchange with, with Ben and I, um, there's a mention that Paletti, you know, had ties to, to the underworld and to underworld organizations. One, this person mentioned called the Red Brigades uh, and the NRA. These are terrorist sects is what this person mentions. Um, and the NR NAR was responsible for a massacre, the Bologna massacre that killed 85 people um, and injured more than 200. Uh, but again, it's, it's, it's very difficult to... I'm not quite sure what this person is, what their angle is. Is it that the terrorist, you know, angle is more accurate, that the the crime boss angle is more accurate, the sex ring angle? It's very difficult to say, and I'm, I'm trying to, we're trying to find out, but um, it's, it's, it's hard to, to kind of pin it down to one particular source. But it certainly does seem like there was some foul play going on. There's also implications that uh, Paletti himself was murdered because of, you know, knowing too much and being able to kind of spill the beans after he retired. Right. Paletti officially died of a heart attack in 1997. Uh, however, you know, there's plenty of precedent for a, a homicide by what appears to be a heart attack. And then also, if we're going to be, if we're going to completely apply critical thinking here, we have to remember that cause of death is ultimately the decision of a medical examiner. God knows there are conspiracy theories aplenty about uh, willfully fallacious uh, medical examinations on bodies, right? Tale as old as time. This this isn't over, right? There was a, another tomb search, an entirely different tomb, uh, back in 2019. The Orlandi family received an anonymous tip, a brief letter that was sent to the Orlandi's lawyer from inside the Vatican. 
and it's pretty cryptic. It shows a stone angel at an unmarked tomb in the Teutonic Cemetery. This is a cemetery that is within the walls of the Vatican. The cemetery isn't even accessible to the general public, but on this uh, on this unmarked tomb, someone has kept a red votive candle lit only at this tomb, only at this specific one, and they've been replacing the flowers on a regular basis. There's one thing engraved on a marble scroll that the the angel, the statuary holds, and it just says uh, the English version would be "Rest in peace." This letter and this cryptic picture, of course, came at a time when there were bombshell confirmations of long-running allegations about uh, sexual abuse within the church. Uh, and this, so part of this is the the timing, I think. Uh, and then this leads to uh, another another decision by the Vatican. Uh, to investigate grave sites. I believe this was in July of last year. Yeah, July of last year, Vatican City decided that they were going to open up two separate tombs, and they were going to allow these tombs to be analyzed by forensic anthropologist Giovanni Arcudi. Or Arcudi. Um, it's, it's really interesting. So the two tombs, one of them was the tomb of the angel. That's the one that was mentioned in that letter. And then actually part of that letter, doesn't it say something about where the angel points? Um, something to that effect within that mm-hmm. letter, uh, referencing the angel's hand. And this one tomb, the tomb of the angel, was meant to contain the remains of two princesses, German princesses, Princess Sophie of, oh, I'm not going to be able to pronounce this, Hollenol, Waldenburg, Berenstein, and the adjacent one, the one that was right next to it, was meant to contain the remains of Duchess Charlotte Frederica of Mecklenburg, uh, oh, Schwerin, Schwerin. And so check this out. There were two princesses, German princesses. That's who's supposed to be in these two tombs that are right next to each other, where this exhumation is going to take place. They did the exhumations on the 11th of July, 2019, Here's the deal. Not only did they not find the body of Emanuela hidden in there, or, you know, they didn't, they don't think they found that body. They also didn't find the bodies of the two princesses that were supposed to be buried Mm -hmm. there. There's a, there's a, uh, uh, seems to be almost a systemic issue with putting bodies where they belong, uh, in at least those two. Uh, burial sites, the Basilica and the Teutonic Cemetery. Yeah, just a few days later, they did find some bodies, not whole bodies, parts of bodies uh, of dozens of individuals. We're talking thousands of human bones that were found underground at the Teutonic College where this um, this burial site where the tombs are located. So how how crazy is that? Okay, we open these two tombs. Those bodies are not there. We don't find any evidence of the body that was allegedly here. But we did find dozens of other individuals that we have no idea of the identities. What what they did find, though, is that those bodies were likely uh, prior to the the 1900s. I believe that's what they found in, in this location. This is something that's happened multiple times over the course of some of these exhumations where the person that's meant to be found there is not there or is there, but with the addition of a bunch of other bones, some of them very old. Yeah, yeah. And to be clear, uh, we're, we're pointing this out, but we're not saying that those are necessarily related to the mystery of Emanuela Orlandi. Uh, we have to remember that the Vatican and the Catholic Church is an ancient institution. There are a lot of people who have uh, passed away over over the millennia. And this means, you know, if you think about it from the other side of the equation, it would be unusual not to find strange, unidentified remains in a cemetery this old. And at this point, uh, the mystery remains unsolved. However, Noel, I believe you have been in contact with your source and there's an update. Yeah, just, you know, um, just in, in going through this together, there was just a few questions that I had, and um, I, I hadn't heard from from this individual since uh, they sent the initial uh, uh 
scans um, and just as we're recording this hearing back and again because of the fact that I'm not sure if this person is an investigative journalist or uh, is part of some kind of organization that's generally trying to like be whistleblowers uh, it's really not clear and they were not comfortable telling any of that stuff so it's you got to take all these documents and, and, and this perspective for what it's worth like we said earlier but um, we had mentioned earlier in the episode uh, this crime family or, or street gang is what this person is saying. They were the Magliani gang. And I asked if th- this person's angle on the story was that there was organized crime involvement and that that was part of a sex trafficking operation that Paletti was essentially leading and I just wanted to clarify if that was what this person believes and they said yes I believe it's abundantly clear that they had relationships with many people of high importance Uh, they supplied these individuals with girls drugs arms cash and more they knew full well that they would never be prosecuted for their crimes as they held in their hands the reputations of those who did the judging Um, and then I asked to clarify about the sex trafficking angle uh, this notion of a sex trafficking ring and I believe referring to the Magliani gang um, this individual says they rose to power in the 70s mostly through drug pushing lotto machine sales robberies and occasional assassination as for the sex trafficking most definitely Paletti was allegedly using the convent as a cover for trafficking his representatives would bring random girls to the convent after a few weeks other high officials would come to collect them from there they would assumedly be brought to the vatican or the neighborhood which surrounded it and uh, this person believes that sometime after the kidnapping orlandi may have been brought to that convent which was called the handmade sisters of the immaculate wow well that's a lot to take in yeah I, I know, and I, I off mic we talked about whether it was even worth mentioning this because it is a lot, and it's just impossible to verify. But at the very least, I think we can take away from this that there's something unusual about this case, and it's hard to put it's it's hard for us to put our fingers directly on it. But uh, organizations like the Vatican that have been around for so long and literally have a whole city of which they control. You know, and not to mention an entire, you know, religious mass, you know, this is huge. I mean, everyone just feel that they they are essentially can do no wrong, um, even though we know they can do wrong and 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 have. And there's been verified cases of this with the sex abuse, obviously. So I just thought it was worth mentioning this person's perspective. And there are documents that do seem to have an air of legitimacy to them. But that's about as far as we can take that. Well, we do know that there is a light at the end of this tunnel, though dim it may be, because we do know that Emmanuel's brother that we mentioned at the top of the show about the the person who you know had a bit of an argument with his sister before deciding not to give her a ride, right? So she took the bus. He is not convinced of any of the, I guess, official stories that are out there. He thinks there's something else that's going on. He has organized an online petition. It's attracted over 100,000 supporters. And the attempt here is to, you know, get the Catholic Church to appeal to the world headquarters of that institution to get them to reveal everything that the institution knows on an official level about this disappearance. Um, it just whether or not they comply, right, is going to be the, the issue. Right. As of now, at least as far as I know, the Vatican maintains that it is doing literally everything in its power to solve this mystery. Of course, uh, Pietro is not convinced. Uh, neither are the thou- more than 100,000 people who signed that uh, petition. And at this point, we hand it to you, fellow conspiracy realist. What do you think? Which of these conspiracy theories which of these theories, really, uh, if any, seem most plausible? Uh, is this a case of someone who ran away? Is this a case of someone who was kidnapped and murdered? Uh, and if so, what makes you ascribe to a particular perspective? Let us know. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Instagram. You can find us on Twitter. We especially love to shout out our Facebook community page. Here's where it gets crazy. 
Yes, join us there to talk about each of these episodes. This one in particular, I guarantee you, there will be a lot of us talking about theories behind all of this and posting things. So join us there. If you don't want to do that, give us a phone call. Our number is one eight three three S T D W Y T K. Again, I've been talking to a lot of you. I've been listening to a lot of messages. I've still got about 50 to go through, and I'll be doing that tonight. But uh, then we'll be caught up, so we're going to need more calls. So please call in with your thoughts on this and any other topic you'd like us to cover in the future. And if none of that quite bags or badgers, you can always contact us directly via our good old-fashioned email. We are conspiracy at iheartradio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.